Recently, I, along with the rest of the world, watched with heavy heart as the Notre Dame Cathedral burned. Sadly, I've never visited the historical building, been to France, or even traveled to Europe, but I've always thought that one day I'd have my photo taken in its iconic shadow. I've been intrigued by Notre Dame since my senior year of high school when I was introduced to its intricate architecture during an art history class where it instantly became a favorite, and not just because of the flying buttresses. A flying buttress is an exterior masonry structure, is typically an arch or a series of arches, and they help to oppose the lateral thrust of a larger arch or a vault. Basically, they are arches that help hold up the walls of larger arches. And while they look really cool and were vital for the structural integrity of many Gothic cathedrals, it's that name, flying buttresses, that get most kids' attention during class. Walk into any classroom of teenagers and announce that they will be discussing the importance of the flying buttress and just see what happens. Hilarity will ensue. Trust me, I know. Because years after the giggling through my art history class, I became the teacher introducing flying buttresses to a class full of high school students. I vividly remember one such lesson about the notorious architecture of the Cathedral of Notre Dame. After we got the laughter out of the way, I talked to them further about the magnificent cathedral. I remember sitting crisscross applesauce on top of a table, gushing over the gargoyles, the towers, the stained glass, and then we moved on to the concept of sanctuary. The word sanctuary means sacred place, but the use of the word in connection to such places has led to a secondary meaning, a place of safety. In medieval Europe, during the building and early use of the Cathedral of Notre Dame, sanctuary also had a legal meaning. Any person who was accused of a crime or was being hunted for any variety of reasons, like witchcraft, gossip, or treason, could claim sanctuary or asylum by entering church property. Once safely within the church walls, one could no longer be punished or pursued. How long the pursued could stay within the church varied according to church locations and leaders. However, for the time they were wrapped within the stone walls, they could not be harmed. I remember telling this particular classroom full of girls these facts. It was like telling them a magical story from a beautiful fairy tale. And when I finished, the room was silent. I thought that these girls must be as enraptured with the romantic history as I was. But it wasn't until the silence was broken with a single voice saying, I wish there were still sanctuaries, followed by a whispered sea of me too's, that I understood. These high school kids weren't fascinated by the architecture, the gargoyles, or the sheer magnitude of the historical edifice. They were longing for what it represented, sanctuary. At the time this occurred, I was a very young 22-year-old teaching art full-time at a lockdown high school facility for what were then called troubled teens. As I sat there on top of the table and looked into their faces, two things happened simultaneously. One being, my young heart began to break, and the other was a realization, something that I'd always known but didn't understand until that moment. Art isn't about what it is. It's about what it represents. Around me were crowded victims of physical, verbal, and sexual abuse, high school girls who had no family and were wards of the state, teens who heard terrible voices in their heads, and others who had repeatedly tried to take their own lives. If there was ever a group who could benefit from a sanctuary, this group would be it. In that moment... I promised myself that starting right then, for always and forever, I would try my best to create what my students would need, a classroom that would become my canvas, a place that wasn't about what it was, but rather about what it represented, a small space that would serve as a sanctuary for any student that entered inside its walls. This is Elizabeth and Liz from Simple Simon and & Company, and you are listening to Stitched. 
Today's episode is sponsored by Baby Lock. Much like patchwork quilting, embroidery also tells the stories of the people who created each piece. Tales of joy or sorrows, prosperity or famine, and contentment or frustration are sewn into each item. And one can tell simply by the material and stitching employed in each project, true stories of grief, thrift, devotion, patience, or even great wealth. Although the basic stitches of embroidery are few, the variations and combinations created by them are countless. The running stitch, the satin stitch, the cross stitch, couching. But today, as we talk about one of France's most beloved structures, we thought it only fitting to pair it with quite possibly the most commonly used knot in embroidery, a knot that was given its name from Notre Dame's homeland, the French knot. The French knot has been around for centuries and, contrary to the name, was likely not developed in France. Rather, similar knots can be seen in historical work around the world, such as in the intricate silk robes of China, the bright handiwork of Brazil, and the beautiful quilts of Persia. If you were to visit a textile museum, you would quickly see the influence that this small and simple knot has had on designs across cultures and items, from practical to extravagant. Because the French knot has been a staple in embroidery for centuries, it can be found in both arts and crafts, as well as on aprons, dresses, skirts, pinafores, curtains, sheets, tablecloths, and quilts. So how did this multi-purpose knot come to be known as the French knot? Well, history is unclear on the exact coining of the phrase. However, these knots were a favorite in the petite point of the 17th and 18th century French courts, and then made their way to fashion and the art scene during the mid-20th century, where the term was most likely born especially here in the United States, where all things European were in vogue. Today's episode is sponsored by Baby Lock. Baby Lock's new genuine collection features sewing machines that start at just $99. Whether you're interested in sewing, quilting, serging, or home decor, there's a genuine collection machine that's perfect for you. Last week, I was visiting one of our local shops and was able to see one of the new Genuine Collection machines called the Zest in action. I was impressed by its simple design, and I think it would make a perfect starter machine for sewists of any age. To learn more about this new line of machines, just visit babylock.com backslash genuine. That's babylock.com backslash genuine. Now, back to our story. A French knot is an embroidery technique in which thread is knotted around itself while stitching to create three-dimensional pearl-shaped dots. These dots can then be sprinkled across fabric like confetti, sewn together in clusters, used as filler, or stitched into lines. They are also commonly seen combined with other stitches to create the center of flowers or eyes on dolls. French knots can be created using a variety of threads, flosses, and yarns and worked onto just about any kind of fabrics, from cottons and linens to wools and flannels. And the size of each knot can be easily adjusted by either wrapping the thread around the needle more times or increasing the number of strands you are stitching with. There are a variety of ways to make French knots, and everyone seems to have a favorite method. But essentially, a French knot is made by looping threads several times around a needle before inserting it back into the fabric in a very close proximity to where it exited the fabric. This results in a small, tight knot that, as you know, adds a nubby texture and decoration to a variety of fabric-based projects. Now, before we go on, we have to admit that French knots often have a bad reputation for being difficult to create. Some of the complaints in creating them include the fact that they are impossible to untie and in many cases need to be cut out if not properly placed. 
At times, thread can become tangled while being pulled. Whole knots can pop through to the back side of the fabric, and knots can be inconsistent, meaning tied too loosely, too tightly, or just plain lopsided. However, with practice and a few helpful tips, you will find that they can actually be quite a simple way to add a little pop to any of your projects once you get the hang of it. Some good rules of thumb for creating French knots include only wrapping the thread around your needle two times, leaving a space of one to two fibers from the exit point when re-entering your needle to act as a bridge or an anchor. This will help prevent those knots from popping through to the back side of your fabric. Watch the tension as you pull your thread. Pulling too tightly results in tiny knots, while holding on too loosely will create loose or irregular knots. Slow down. Pulling too quickly can result in tangled thread. Try using a milliner's needle. And finally, practice, practice, and practice. It isn't hard to see why the French knot has become a staple stitch throughout the centuries. Its classic understated shape and design complements just about any project. And we don't see it losing its most used place of honor in the decorative stitch category anytime soon. I love the structure of Gothic cathedrals with their naves, transepts, choirs, and ambulatories. I love the meanings that are built into their very literal design. I love the vaults and the towers, the stone and the stained glass and the sculptures. But most of all, I love what it taught me that day as a very young teacher who needed some insight. After teaching art for several years, I moved on to public junior high where I enjoyed my time as a special ed teacher. And I remember sitting there in my classroom one day, cross-legged on the floor during lunch. My room was packed with kids eating and talking and having races with my hermit crabs across the table. It was an ordinary day, but I felt tired and I just wanted a few minutes of quiet. I thought about kicking the usual crowd back out into the halls. And then I caught sight of a small picture I cut from a calendar of the Cathedral of Notre Dame, and I remembered. It's not about what it is. The noise, the chaos, the laughter. It's about what it represents. A safe place to hang out, away from the crowd. A place where you're always welcomed and loved. A sanctuary. And I said a silent prayer of gratitude for the lesson and for the much-needed reminder and for the luxury of being able to afford a group of awkward, gangly, ridiculously stinky junior high kids four square walls of safety. I say a lot of prayers nowadays, prayers for safety and of gratitude. Today, the world seems to be in constant turmoil. Anger and hate often feel victorious, and sometimes I'm discouraged. Where is the sanctuary, I ask? And then I meet a group of quilters who have donated piles of quilts to veterans, a neighbor who made a quilt for another neighbor grieving a loss, a friend who mailed a quilt to a family member who is struggling through difficult times, a mom sewing up a quilt for her daughter to take off to college with her, or the woman I met last month in a parking lot who told me all about the quilt she received from a stranger in the hospital just before her child passed away. She keeps this quilt in her bedroom, and on bad days she holds it on her lap. She told me the quilt provides her with comfort and gives her peace. We stood there, two strangers in front of a grocery store, tears flowing, exchanging stories. She had never met someone who donated those kind of quilts. I had never met anyone who'd received them. Lemony Snicket said in his book, A Series of Unfortunate Events, Sanctuary is a word which here means a small, safe place in a troubling world. Last spring, my daughter and I were involved in a car accident. We were hit from behind by a speeding driver. As I stood on the side of the road with my daughter, who was shaken, crying, and wet, a police officer appeared from behind with something fluffy and warm that he wrapped around my scared little girl. It was a quilt, donated to the police for such a time. And just like that, my daughter was provided with a small, safe place in a troubling world. 
It isn't about what it is, fibers, threads, French knots, or pieced fabric. It's about what it represents, love, friendship, family, safety, peace, sanctuary. Thank you to whoever donated that quilt to my daughter. Thank you to whoever pieced that quilt received by the stranger I met at the grocery store. And thank you to everyone who stitches together small, safe places in this troubling world for others. The world needs all the sanctuaries it can get. For more stories, projects, and quilt tutorials, visit us over at www.simplesimonandco.com where you can find scores of quilting patterns and inspiration. Thanks for listening. And if you have a minute, please leave us a comment or a review, especially if you're listening on iTunes. It only takes a few clicks, but it helps us out a lot. Now, stay tuned for I've Got a Notion. Okay, so here's the deal. This is the I've Got a Notion segment of Stitched. You know, that few minutes at the end of an episode where we tell you all about how pinking shears work or why women in the Middle Ages kept tomato pin cushions on their fireplace mantles. But today, today I'm changing things up a bit. In last week's episode, It Takes a Hive, Elizabeth talked about her dad keeping bees, and we shared the history of quilting bees. And then this week, as I was writing about Notre Dame, I couldn't stop thinking about the coolest factoid I recently learned about bees and Notre Dame. So I'm taking over the segment to talk about something that relates to this week and last week's episodes, and I hope that you'll like it. Did you know that aside from everything else, the 5,000 gargoyles, the priceless paintings, and the 13 million people that visit the cathedral every year, that on top of Notre Dame, there are also a series of beehives? It's true. Notre Dame is home to over 180,000 bees. The hives, located just below the cathedral's iconic rose window, on the roof over the sacristy, provide the bees with a sanctuary all their own. Placed there back in 2013 as part of a citywide initiative to help bolster the declining honeybee population, the bees have taken up residency inside three wooden hives that collectively produce over 165 pounds of honey each year. The sweet stuff is produced from what is gleaned from surrounding gardens, like the one located just behind the cathedral, and when harvested is given away to the needy within the parish community. Pretty cool, right? And you know what else is amazing? According to their keeper, Nicholas Gent, the bees not only survived the massive fire that just happened, but their homes are intact and they seem to be buzzing in and out of their hives as though everything is business as usual. Thanks for letting me take over this week's selection of I've Got a Notion. Next week, we'll be back with a tale about zippers. But until then, happy quilting! Happy quilting!